on the purpose of Galatians. We went through the historical and the doctrinal section, and now we're going to move on to the purpose of Galatians concerning Jesus Christ. And our question that Dave asks is, how is the role of Jesus Christ in fulfilling God's plan to save mankind from sin emphasized in these passages. And uh, I remember, I guess it's only maybe Jeff and Sandra, I put, the, I put the verses on the PowerPoint um, kind of for time's sake, plus then when you're reading, looking up, uh, I can hear everyone. But if you want to read from your Bible, that's fine. Um, but either way, um, we have them. So our first verse was uh, Galatians 2 and verse 20. Maybe I'll start in front. Jared, do you want to read that? I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Okay. So how is... Christ emphasize in this passage? How does Paul emphasize Jesus that you see? I might make the first point is that we see here uh, Paul, like us, uh, is living day to day, being guided by the revelation through Jesus Christ and going along with the thoughts in Galatians He's doing that instead of living by the law that came from Moses. So how do you, Jeremy? Well, Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. So Paul compares how he's living. He's not living by himself. He's not living spiritually because he's such a great man who followed the law and was perfect. He's living as a Christian because Christ loved us first and gave himself up for us to, so that our sins could be forgiven. Right. So when he says Christ lives in me, well, Christ only lives in us through faith. Uh, uh, he says, I live by faith. And so Christ lives through us. We submit ourselves to Christ because of what Christ did. Right, exactly. Christ lives in us through our actions. Doesn't he? That's another way of thinking that. And uh, we remind ourselves that these are the pronouns here in individualize the love and death of Christ, doesn't it? Regardless of whomever Christ might have died for, he died for me, he died for you. Um, it's good to, to individualize that on yourself. Um, remind ourselves, he died for me because of my sins that I might have. And we can apply this faith, this thought, to our hearts. Good to remember that. No other thoughts? So our next verse then is Galatians 3, verse 8, and verse 16. Uh, Andre, do you want to get verse 8, the top one? And Therese, you can do the bottom one. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, <clears throat> saying, All the nations will be blessed in you. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one. And to your seed, that is Christ. Okay. 
So in these two verses, um, how is Jesus emphasized in these passages? You see. Well, he makes it clear here that Christ is the seed that had been promised to the Lord of Abraham. Exactly, yeah. That's right, Tan. We know he is the seed. He is the one that salvation will come through. How would we be justified? By faith. On, okay, right. On the grounds of, of what, what did Christ do for us? You think? I just reminded myself of this, that we're justified on the grounds of the, the shed blood of Christ. Um, he was the seed of Abraham, and not Paul. Remember, sometimes I try and keep the, the whole thought of Galatians in my mind. Paul's having us consider the law and what Christ has done for us. Um, so the seed of Abraham has justified us through his shed blood not on the basis of perfect obedience to the law which is impossible anyway okay. sometimes we refer to the seed of promise and we talk about oh as Judah and David and, right. and go all the way through that Paul really does make the point here the seed of promise was uh, Isaac was the prom promised son that Abraham would have. God promised Abraham a son, and it would be through Abraham's seed. So all of these children were necessary right. to get to Christ. But the seed of promise is actually Christ. Uh, it, we're not wrong for for using that. We we, under we understand what we're saying, but when it gets down to what Paul's arguing here, seed of promise is Christ. Right. So, as you said, it's not Israel, it's not Moses, it's Christ and Christ alone. And right. that's why we're justified by Christ, not the law, because exactly. he's the seed. Yeah, good point. And this is a good verse for us to always remember, is like Sharice read, and to your seed, and if Paul plainly says, that seed is Christ. It's the, that's who has brought about. Um, our salvation that's who all nations are going to be blessed through by, by Christ no other thoughts well we'll move on to Galatians 3 in verse 10 and 11 to 14 but I, I split it up on the slide maybe Gord you read this slide please or as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse for it is written cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law reform now that no one is justified by the law before god is evident for the righteous man shall live by faith however the law is not of faith on the contrary he who practices them shall live by them okay and carla 13 or 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Okay. Paul tells us that man must be justified by what? Paula? Okay. Yes, exactly. Um, where did I lose here? Oh, okay. And why then can we not be justified by the law? What have we been finding out about the law all along? First, we know Agor. Eh, right, right, exactly. It's impossible. Think of Romans three and and twenty three. 
for all have sinned and fallen short. And once we understand then that we cannot keep the law, it's impossible to keep the law, okay, then what does the law pronounce upon us? You think of Deuteronomy 27 and 26, and even right here. What does the law pronounce upon us? Cursed. 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 Right, right. Sorry. I That's still the way we've all had the same thing. I can hear so. my truck in my ears, so <laughs> <laughs> Gord understands. Uh, speak up, and plus our masks kind of mess things up too, don't they? That's right. So the law, we're told we can't keep it. It's impossible. But yet we tell ourselves, well, we're going to keep it. Well, it's impossible. And the law pronounces upon us then a curse. Cursed is he, Deuteronomy 27 and 6, says, Cursed is he who does not conform the words of this law by doing them. And then all the people shall say amen. So we're told that we're cursed of God. Um, James 2 and 10 tells us that also. For whoever keeps the law, the whole law, and yet stumbles in one point, only one point, he's become guilty of all. And yet, what do we see in our daily religious practices? People want to live by the law and still conform to Moses looking for salvation and it's impossible to keep it and, and, and it's important to know as Paul makes the point in Romans it's not the law's fault no, no. That, that, well, I know you're not making that right. point either but, but even for those who are watching online it's not the law's fault the, the, like as far as the curse that the law pronounces is the problem it's not the law itself that's the problem no. but the reason the law pronounces a curse and and there's nothing we can do about it is because the law couldn't take away sin. That's the where as I'm sure is where you're going with in Galatians. Christ's blood can forgive sins. That's why we're redeemed from the curse. Right. Uh, it, it's we committed sin. We deserve to be cursed. Christ became a curse Oops. by bearing our sins on the cross, dying for our sins, and. And uh, therefore, we can be justified by faith. Right, right. We we'll get into that some of those deeper thoughts later on in the lesson. But still, it's good to keep thinking of this point, um, reminding ourselves then that Jesus would remove that curse. And also, we need to remember that God never intended to save man through perfect legal obedience so we need to remember that his method through all ages has been through faith has it not we think of abraham abraham existed centuries before the law and, and what did god how did god bless him what did god say about abraham why did he bless him he didn't bless him because of perfect obedience to the law. It wasn't even around. Blessed by faith. Right, Jeff, yeah. Because Abraham packed up and headed to Canaan, didn't he? And that's all God has ever asked us. And in our study in Galatians 3 here in verse 13 and 14, here we read that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. We know we can't keep it. We resort to our fleshly desires more sometimes than the divine things that God has told us. And so we fall short in the law. Um, and yet here we're told that Christ redeems us from that. You know, it's pretty amazing when we think of that, isn't it? Um, that he was willing to to do that. So we'll 
Are you gonna yeah. are you gonna deal with cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree? Or, or are you gonna do that later? The which Jeff? Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Are are you gonna deal with that later? Um No, you Okay. You I was saying it, it was interesting to note from Deuteronomy twenty one, which is where the quote's taken from. Well, that okay. I hadn't noticed this before. It says if anyone has committed a sin deserving of death, and he is put to death, you can hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain overnight on the tree. But you shall bury him that day, so you do not defile the land the Lord your God is giving you. And Jesus, of course, wasn't deserving of death, but that's the reason he was crucified, uh, as far as that the Jews thought he was deserving of death. But it's it, when you get to after Christ died, we we know the hurry that was that that that, that the Jews had to get him off the cross, and we always say, well, that Sabbath was coming, and it was. And they, they wouldn't want that. But Deuteronomy told them, don't let the body hang overnight. Right. Now, the Romans did that. The Romans didn't care. The Romans kept people on dead bodies on a cross for days as an example. The Jews didn't want that. Uh, and it shows the hypocrisy of the Jews in one sense. They, it was, they, right. they had no problem crucifying Christ, which would have been against the law, because they had lying witnesses and they didn't have proof. Right. But then they had these other legal requirements. We can't keep them on the cross for, uh, because that will defile the land. And uh, But I just thought that was interesting. Right, that is. I was, that was in Deuteronomy 21? That's, that's Deuteronomy 21, oh, okay. verse, um, uh, verse uh, 22 and 23. Oh, okay. Good point. Yeah, I never got out of Deuteronomy 27. Yeah. But that's true. That does show the hypocrisy, doesn't it? Of, uh, of their whole plan to rid themselves of, of Jesus. That's a good point. Uh, we move on then to Galatians 4, 4 to 5. Uh, Sandra, do you want to read that, please? So then we might redeem those who are under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. And you are a son. God has sent forth the spirit of the son into our hearts from Abba Father. Okay, thank you. So how is Christ emphasized in this passage? That's verses 5 and 6, isn't it? Oh, is it? Yeah. No? I might have put down the wrong ones. Yep. Well, be four or five or five. Galatians <coughs> four. And I've got uh ah, right. You just you just wrote the wrong verse. Right. You have the right verses, but you just wrote That's right. them wrong. Imagine a mistake on the PowerPoint. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well yeah, we need verse four. I'll I'll read read you verse 4 then this is verse 5 I don't know what happened before but verse 4 says but when the fullness of the time had come God sent forth his son born of a woman born <coughs> under the law to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons so in this passage then we got the right verses now how do you see Christ being emphasized in these passages? I might begin by asking you then, when did God send forth his son? You were good and all ready for him. <laughs> when the fullness of time had come. Right, right. That's Ephesians 1 and 19 comes, to, or 9 comes to mind. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. Um, so we see that, first of all, in the world, the system that was being carried out at that time, God said it's time now. Man's ready. Sure. I also note that there were two conditions that 
Paul set out, and even God said, in order for Christ to redeem man, he had to be born of a woman. In other words, the animal sacrifices were not sufficient because the animal didn't sin. Right. The animal couldn't sin. It's not the animal didn't sin. The animal couldn't. So he had to be born of a woman. And to redeem those who were under the law, he also had to show the Jews that you could keep the law. He was exposing their sins and that you didn't keep the law. But Christ did keep the law. Right. And so by being born under the law, he showed the Jews the futility that they had in trying to keep the law, because they didn't. Right. But that this idea that, oh, well, God's being unreasonable, he's not. I, I, I kept the law fully, that's why I can redeem you who didn't. Right. Because he was perfect. Right. Uh, so he had to be born under the law to expose the sin of the Jews who tried to keep it but broke it. And he had to be human in order to shed his blood because it was only the shed, shedding of a sinless man, a sinless human being, right. that would remit sin. Right. We need to remember that Jesus, being a Jew, okay, was obligated to obey every precept of the law of Moses. And he was distinguished from every Is Israelite in that he kept it perfectly, as Jeremy said. In doing so, then, he's become able to redeem us who would not keep it perfectly. And thus, this is where I reminded myself, thus, he becomes the curse now for them and for us, which is kind of, has to make you think that we're the created. We've served ourselves, but we're cursed of God, and we'll look at that word later on in the lesson. Um, and yet Christ now has redeemed us, and he's opened the door that word can be adopted as sons and daughters. You know, I thought of uh, Ephesians 1 and 5. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. For those that say God is an unfair God, um, these thoughts and, and verses uh, ought to blow our minds we can use that term. Christ not only died that we might find the forgiveness of our sins, that that curse might be wiped from us, but now the Father has adopted us as sons and daughters because of, of Jesus. This amazing thought, how kind uh, the Lord is to us. So we'll end that section. That includes our, concludes our study on the purpose. And we move now into the content of Galatians. And we want to look at the thought of the authority of Paul's apostleship and his message. Remember the beginning of, of Galatians, how he spent time trying to have the Galatians understand that I am who I say I am, and I have the authority to tell you these things. And so we're asked the question, how do the following passages demonstrate the legitimacy of Paul's apostleship and passage? So we, Galatians 1, Verses 11 and 12. Uh, Jeff, do, do you want to read that, please? For I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me was not according to man. <clears throat> For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through, the re through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay. You weren't going to trust my PowerPoint if <laughs> I got the verses there. <laughs> um, so how then do we see here? How does this passage demonstrate to us 
the legitimacy of, of Paul's apostleship and his message. What's he first point out here? He was the preacher of that gospel, but it was not according to man, neither him nor anyone else. He didn't receive it from man. He just taught it. Right. By Christ. Exactly. So he received it from Christ, didn't he? He didn't get it from anybody else. Um, you know, and that should have been uh, common sense for them if we think about it. Um, and really, you know, when we think of the Bible and the, the whole revelation, the gospel cannot be claimed as an invention of man even by relig religious leaders today. Um, it doesn't even characterize, does it, a human style of writing. Nor would we devise the gift of eternal life through a dying Savior. Um, you know, that, that's just secular thinking. It doesn't even make sense if we sat down to, to think of a plan. Um, and Paul's trying to to have them understand this. Um, like I said, you don't to make that point. You just have to look out at the other religions in the world to know it's true. Because right. you take a look at Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, uh, all of these other things. What is it? Justification by works. That's what man's idea is. Justification by works. Yeah. God's idea. Justification by grace. That God saying, rely on me. It's not that you don't have to obey. You have to obey. That's part of faith. But rely on me. Don't rely on your own goodness, your own self, because you can't do that. Because you're not. Yeah. Uh, that's the point. You just look out at the other religions and you know Christianity is different. Christ's doctrine is different because of who saved us. Right. Yeah. When I think of that and, and examine my thinking, I see pride because I want to be able to say I can do it. I'm justified because of who I am. Well, I don't know. <laughs> We're not. That's selfish, um, prideful thinking as far as I'm concerned with myself. I want to look like the one that has done it, um, which isn't the case. And Paul's trying to have the the Galatians, of course, going back to thinking about the law and comparing the law and the gospel, um, he's having them try to understand, you know, that first of all, no, this didn't come from man, it came from God. Third, oh, Jake. Yeah, um, just say, you know, if you look at the Bible and look at the the inspired writers, you know, we can see a, a lot of men, different men, coming to the same, having the same message. You know, um, I was talking to a guy, from, he's a Muslim, and, um, you know, he's refuting the fact that we have too many people, you know, too many writers of the Bible versus um, the Muslim religion, the Quran is only one person. You know, and I'm saying, we show even more the validity. You know, if you have a lot of persons calling the same message, isn't it better than having one person giving you a message? You know, and Paul, Paul, <coughs> was actually taught by Christ himself. It's not like he's taking any second that information. You know? He's, uh, so, these, um, so when you look at the Bible as a whole, we can go refuting the fact. It's, it's the same consistent message right here. You know? Yeah, exactly. With that thought, and Jeremy said, can't help but think of all that's going on in the Catholic Church at this time. And I was thinking the other day, 
you know, it's all because of their Pope. And every one of them has a different thought of how to be righteous. And it's all, every time they make a change, they're getting, they get away from something that's closer to morally right and upstanding. And they keep moving away from that. And it's all in an effort, and it, it's almost like a quote through their speech that they're losing members, you know? And that, those kind of dealings in the, in the religious world helps prove to me more and more God's revelation is pure and holy and it's his wisdom and you look at that and compare it to the wisdom of the religious rulers today it speaks for itself doesn't it you know well we move on to uh galatians 1 15 and 17 15 to 17 and we'll look again here. How does Paul demonstrate? How does this passage demonstrate the legitimacy of Paul's apostleship? Uh, Tony, do you want to read that? Yeah, please. Well, well God, who had said? Oh. Uh, no, sorry. Go sorry. ahead, Tim. No, go ahead, Tim. Yeah. <laughs> who has set me apart even oh. from my mother's womb and called me through His grace? was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Okay. Thinking of this passage and what we just read, how how does this demonstrate? How does Paul demonstrate the legitimacy of, of his apostleship and his message? No central church doctrine. I didn't go up to Jerusalem. Alright, so I didn't get it from man earlier. Right. I didn't get it from some other church either. Right. Uh, uh, I That's didn't go up point. to Jerusalem to the apostles. This is this is not. You can't come along and call this Church of Christ. If uh, to use modern vernacular, Church of Christ doctrine. This is Christ doctrine. I went away, at, but even when you come along and say this, it's the same message. The apostles didn't have a different message. Neither did the Church of Jerusalem. Right. And that and that should show its validity even more. Paul went away. He was taught by Christ. And he's still teaching the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. I thought of that too, you know, and for the Jews especially too. Did they not have seen that? You know, um, they knew what was being taught uh, in Jerusalem. But it's interesting too that Paul states that God chose or destined him from birth. To his occupation of preaching. God had chose him already. No matter what his youth consisted of, I thought of that. Um, and we know what Paul, how he dealt with the early Christians, but God's plans were going to be fulfilled, weren't they? Um, you know, we think that Jesus appeared to Paul, yes. But Paul's heart was changed. The individual, the man himself, Paul, he, God didn't magically change him. He appeared to him, and Christ spoke with him. But always remember, you know, it, it was his heart that changed. In the same manner with you and I. Um, but the call was given to Paul as it's been given to us through his grace, isn't it? You know, and that's the case with any of us. Um, anyone who is called 
through the blood of Christ is saved through the grace of God. And, and Paul emphasizes that his call was through an exceptional call of God. Okay, we understand that, and we weren't all called in that manner. Um, of course, God appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus, but 1 Timothy 1, uh, I didn't put that up. I thought of that. I'll just read that to us. 1 Timothy 1, um, 12 to 17, Paul says here, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a, a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason, I obtain mercy that in me first, Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. I just thought to remind ourselves of, of Paul's attitude. Um, yes, it was an exceptional calling. Um, and, you know, sometimes we might think, well, if Christ appeared to me, then that'd be no problem. I changed my heart. Well, what did Jesus say about the rich man wanting to come back for his brothers? <laughs> Even if I sent you back, they're not going to change their hearts. So it's just good to remind. Okay? There's a difference between Paul and those brothers in the story. The brothers had hearts of unbelief uh, that were hard. Paul's heart wasn't hard against God. He thought he was doing the will of God. He did it ignorantly, he said, in unbelief. Right. He didn't excuse what he did, but but like as far as, there was a reason Christ appeared to him and that caused him to repent. Uh, Christ, uh, he, he still had to repent though. Like as far as, if yes. he had a hard heart, Christ appeared to him. He would have He would have thought he was hallucinating or would have, would have denied something. Uh, Paul's heart was such that he thought he was doing right, and once he showed he was not, he changed. Right. Exactly. Good point. Um, is what, still two uh, minutes? Two minutes. Hmm. Well, we'll try, well, I'll read this <coughs> passage. Bill, and, hey? just one thought about uh, that. Some people might look at that and think that because God had a plan, for Paul, Paul really didn't have any choice in what he does. Right. Uh, but that's not what Paul said to Agrippa in Acts 26. Uh, he said after Jesus appeared to him and told Agrippa about that, he said, therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Yeah. Paul wouldn't have said that if he had no choice to do what Jesus said. Yeah. Uh, he said, no, I wasn't. Dis in other words, he implies that he could have chose differently, but he did not. Yeah. He chose to do what Jesus told him to do. Exactly. Good point. Yeah. 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 Paul constantly, didn't he, well, through his life, made those kinds of, of points. Um, and I had a thought a minute ago with what Jeremy had said, and now I just lost it. Um, I forget what. Uh, um, oh, it was along the thoughts of, okay. Paul doing things ignorantly. Okay, he was, before Christ appeared to him, he was, in his own mind, to those that lived around him, was a righteous man. He, he, he practiced what he professed to believe in. Um, you know, and then I think maybe of myself, well, Paul said he was the chiefest of sinners, and sometimes we want to say, well, Paul, 
uh, he had a better chance, was given more. Well, you know, I knew the word in the beginning, and I disobeyed it. You know what I mean? I, I didn't disobey it ignorantly. I disobeyed it knowingly. And yet God still offers us um, that forgiveness. I'm not ashamed to 